Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet. Or deep in the ocean, casting nets. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend. Joined tonight with John King, the crappie hippie. John, you're in charge. Take it away. All right, I'm John King, the crappie hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas. And we have got a fun show for you here tonight. Uh, we're going to do some fish in the news to get started, but uh, you want to talk about something for a few minutes here before we get going? Yeah, what do you want to go with? Well, Jeff and I, <laughs> Jeff, I know it, I know it. Jeff and I, we, 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 we've we been on the GAR research. Jeff we've is our on, effing librarian. Jeff is our effing librarian. Speaking of Jeff which, it's Danielson. been a minute since John's brought us a book, or Jeff's brought us a book. You know, and what's crazy is that maybe people are going to start switching jobs around here because jeff's been all about fly fishing and been doing a lot of fly fishing and culinary or mm-hmm. culinary culinary uh, stuff <laughs> and and uh i got todd correa reads books he has a review he wants to do mm-hmm. he's got authors his friends he's got all kinds of stuff going on there so we may we may play a little musical chairs with people's jobs here in, in upcoming episodes you but- know for what we pay them <laughs> i know it i know it we, i mean we doubled we, everybody's salary you doubled my double. salary i went from zero to zero point zero you're welcome yeah well i had to you. dig deep i had to fire someone for that <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad i made the cut you yeah, know congratulations yeah showing no. up is what it counts around here <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um you know at glass water we're chugging right along i'm tying a lot of jigs i'm going to put a lot of jigs up on the site here in a couple of weeks and i hope everybody gets excited about it um got a lot of interest in a lot of things the dog days of summer and the heat waves and this and that have kind of cooled things off a little bit but uh do what we do we found a species that wants to bite in this nonsense and we're going to have a couple stories about that excited Donaldson. yeah he's going to talk about how to fly fish for him then he's going to talk how to cook them I don't know how you're going to throw it in there, Clay. I've got it divided in two um, you pieces. Give it, you give it to me how you want it. Uh, oh, whoa. Talk to me like that. Ah. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we're going to uh, get Jeff on the show. But I got some fish in the news. It's a lot of fun. And oh. um, if you don't have button? anything, uh, hit the button. Nope. That's not the right button. Jesus. <laughs> I quit, John. I can't get the one button right. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, I have one just, job. Uh, hit the button. And I can't, <laughs> I can't hit the button. You can get the button. You can get the button. Well, you know, it's all right. It's all right. You know, I have my own, uh, my own quirky impairments as well. No big deal. Okay, so this first one. John, it's been the same button in- for, five, for 10 years. Like, I have not changed buttons. I should be able to learn right. the button. All right, now tell uh, your story. Tell your story. I don't care. But well, the button I, bothers I, me. John, no, the button bothers me. Button bothered by the button. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that people ask me. Look, there's light switches on my ha- in my house that I'm like, does this one go up or down to light? Me too. You know? Me too. Yeah. And I'll, I've never remembered. I've lived here for 34 years. Yeah. I, I, you know, what? What? Am I supposed to be perfect? Yes. I, uh, Get together, forget John. it. Don't hold out for that. It, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, I, I'm using that place to remember that light switch for something more important. Exactly. Exactly. All right. All give right. us the news, John. Sorry about that. All right. I'm going to be bothered by this button. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm bothered by the light switch. So thanks uh, a lot. Broke the whole show. <laughs> yes, indeed. We're pre-distracted. All right. All right. This was submitted by Tim Beat, my former co-host on Lure Love. And it is Tampa Bay, or not Tampa Bay, but Tampa mm. Mayor Jane Castor out fishing with family, hooks more than she bargained for. And pulls in a bale of cocaine. Oh, yes. Worth, uh, like $10 million or something. Cocaine fish. I actually covered this in the regular daily news I do on the radio. Well, it is an older story, but we're not exactly cutting edge. This one's from uh, uh, the 9th of August. Mm-hmm. And more than a million. I said $10 million. They say it's right around a million dollars here. Yeah, they say um, she knew exactly what it's worth because she used to work in drug enforcement. 
she did. In fact, she basically was in the police uh, department for 31 years, did pretty much every job there was to do there from starting out as a street cop to becoming a detective to eventually spending six years as police chief and then moving on to become the mayor. Um, they were out near Marathon in the Keys, and her brother said, hey, look at that. There's a floating object. And I guess even the smallest floating objects will attract little minnows and stuff that'll hide in there to get some shade or maybe there's some plankton or whatnot growing on it sure and so they yeah they pulled in close and um she's like wait a minute mm -hmm. yeah she knew right away what it was so they they came on over they they cut it open they looked inside and 70 pounds of neatly packaged cocaine uh, inside john so, what kind of party would you throw uh <laughs> i don't know do they give a finder's uh, finder's fee for that kind of stuff i, I mean, know like, <laughs> like i don't want the cocaine but i like the money that's what I'm saying. Do they give you any money though? You I, turn I, in the cocaine. I, 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 I go into uh, business. Uh, 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 uh. I'm a good daddy now. I don't, I don't, I don't dabble. I, I don't dabble no. in no crime on that level. No, no, no. I'd have someone else do it for. I get a broker. <laughs> <laughs> you need a, you need a fish cocaine broker. <laughs> oh, we do so many of these stories. I don't know why cocaine and fish goes together so many ways in so many situations. It's a but. perfect match. I guess, but they, you know, we know this happens. We know that, that uh, runners throw stuff overboard. And, uh, well, in this case, they threw it in front of somebody that knew exactly what it was. <sighs> and the funny thing is, is they took it on board and pretty much headed straight in. But it was a while, I guess, before she, she could, could get a signal. Mm -hmm. uh, she GPS the spot so that they go out and search for more if they wanted to. But she wanted to get shut yeah. of this situation so she could... <laughs> Not be a cop, but actually get back to her fishing. Well, well and, and you didn't want, and she doesn't want to get stopped without reporting that she's got 70 pounds of cocaine on her boat. Yeah. I mean, even in Florida, uh, the mayor of Tampa probably shouldn't be hauling around a million. No, they the say the threshold for cocaine for the mayor of Tampa in Florida is 68 pounds. So 70 straight out, <laughs> forget it too much. Yeah. It's just too much. Too much over the limit. You know, we're going to. Even even the even the investigators had to take notice. That's right. right. Oh, if you, you that's too far, Governor or, or Mayor. So yeah, Mayor, I'm yeah. sorry, but you are yeah. you over, are two pounds over, over the, the limit. limit. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. She yeah. limited out on cocaine. That's great news. And they yeah, didn't figure out whose news. cocaine it was, but you know, somebody in Cuba or wherever it came from got fired or murdered for that. I possibly, possibly, although I, you know, it depends on how up the, the ladder, because the one thing they don't want them is getting caught with it, because that's when you get killed, you get caught with it, then you spill sure. on your they, boss. They'd rather and see that's it. that's when they come after you. They'd rather see it floating in the ocean than like be caught with a human being who can say, oh, that was, you know, Joe Blow over there gave me that. Yeah. 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 Blow is a cocaine yeah. term. It is. I did it on purpose, well, John. That was a joke. That was a cocaine was a great pun. Yeah. Cocaine punt. I learn something new every yeah. day. Yeah, blow. All right. Yeah. All right. Now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come at you with an even older story. All right, bring it on. Uh sent in by several people, including Tim Beat. Uh, but a great story. This one's from back in July. Um Tim Shaddock, Australian fellow, made Good day. 51. Mm -hmm. Good day. And uh his dog Bella set out from La Paz, Mexico for French Polynesia and got caught in a storm. He came from it, Mexico to French Polynesia. Yeah. Do you know I, how I so, don't know yeah, what, that's so far? Wait, where is French Polynesia? What? It's in the Polynesian Ocean. No, it's, it's down in the <laughs> Pacific. I have it's no out. idea. How close to Mexico is French Polynesia? No, it's a, it's a long, this guy is a sailing adventurer. I don't right. know that he actually sailed all the way from Australia to Mexico, but he could do it. He is right. that uh uh into it and that experience and and that savvy but he just had a bit of bad luck and somehow this storm which would be bad enough which right. would you know be harrowing enough to take your you know guts and have them just fall clear out your behind uh but he survived that but it knocked out all the electronics on his boat so he came, wait wait I'm, so i'm looking at a giant map of the earth french okay. polynesia from mexico is incredibly far it is incredibly far. It's literally in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean, closest island to like the Cook Islands, right? Yeah. But even yeah, that's, that's not right. close. And then and then you get to Sa Samoa and Tonga, Fiji, as you go west, and then New Zealand. It is really far. It is really far. And I, I, you know, these articles, all of them, 
you know, these articles are just actually, I wish I'd meet the original person. I mean, the one I got off the UK independent, I think was the best. Um, but you know, a lot of these people are just regurgitating, uh, I'm basically plagiarizing someone else's work. Sure. Um, but you know, it's quite possible that he was, you know, going from La Paz to French Polynesia, check it out, get some rest and then going from there back home to Australia. I mean, that this is guy, some kind of brave you, I, you can't pay me to cross that kind of open ocean in a small boat. I would be so no. scared. It's like, there's nothing forever. No, yeah. I'm out. I quit. I hate this story. Uh, well, <laughs> it is, it is scary. And he actually said that. You know, he, he, you know, his training and so forth. I don't know if you've ever read um, uh, The Old Man in the Sea. Yes. By, when I was uh, a Hemingway. freshman in high school, I had to go to summer school. And that oh. was my reading assignment. Well, I, I read it about once a year. It's, it's one of my favorites. And, and uh, you know, his survival reminded me. Everybody's like, oh, it's like that movie with uh, Castaway or Marooned or whatever that. Yeah, that's a great movie, movie was. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. And then, although if he would have just, quit burning all the wood at night and would have just made a big smoky fire during the day it had been rescued in four days boring um yeah boring, there's no story there boring but it's you know always send a mile high column of smoke into the air instead of one little light that a plane happens to be flying at night might see but um anyway that's neither here nor there <laughs> the fact is it reminds me more of old man in the sea because of him catching and eating the raw fish the different kinds of fish that are, you know, and catching the rainwater in, in the, in the sails and so forth. Right. And he said, you know, he, he, he was, he was, you know, but on by the thing, uh, dealing with the, the great isolation was really hard. And had he not had Bella with him, he, it would have been that much harder, maybe even, um, insurmountable, but he never gave up hope. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he just kept sailing along and, uh, well, he had to save Bella, and Bella had to save him. So pretty good, Mr. Shaddock, age 51. Here's one for the old school. Three months at sea, spotted by a helicopter that was accompanying a tuna trawler to try to get what shreds of tuna are left in our oceans and uh, save the guy. So that's awesome. That is awesome. I, so I, I must have missed something. Who is Bella? Bella is the dog. It's kind the of dog. a dog. He ate the dog? He did not eat the dog. He shared oh his my. fish with the dog. I ate the dog. Well, I guess day one, that. day one, John, <laughs> day one, yeah, day right. one, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not hungry yet, but I suspect it's coming dog's lunch. That's it. Game over. Okay. I'm no bread, competing. no, no, no mustard, no, no. ketchup. Well, Manny, so okay, nice yeah, but he had plenty of salad. fishing, he had fishing equipment, he oh, had, you know, the stuff so he could get his bait and all that, but tell the truth. You know, he must have really known his stuff because you get over some of those deeper trenches, you get out there in the middle and there really are no fish to catch. There must be. And, you know, it's crazy. But, uh, but yeah, the thing is that Bella was like his, his mental health, uh, medicine is his mental health so facilitator. I, I wonder, so. was Bella even bothered by this or was Bella like, Hey, this is great. We're on a boat. We're floating every day. He's excited about being a dog. Hey, yeah, I'm a dog. I got, got Tim all to myself. Let's eat some Actually, fish the picture together. Of, picture of bella is so cute because she's rolled up on her back and someone's getting ready to pet her on the tummy so oh. she didn't seem to you know physically they were pretty good shape but he said the the you know yeah i think the whole situation probably rolled right off of bella uh but but tim tim needed her and she was there for her so i'm glad he didn't eat her that's good i would i'm I, you know good for him i would eat tim too i don't care like john <laughs> john if you got you and i get stuck at sea even in a pond like the motor breaks down on my boat you're with me on my boat uh-huh. You're a goner. I'm a goner. There's huh? no saving you. I'm eating you for lunch. Like that's it. I'm, we could die out here, John. Sorry, buddy. Yep. I like you, well, but I like food more. Okay. Well, yeah. when I tell you about my various diseases, you might change your mind. Well, I'll cook you well. <laughs> <laughs> I think they say right. 165 degrees kills everything. Uh, we're good to go. All right. I'll keep a meat thermometer on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Along with an ample supply of charcoal. All mm -hmm. right. And a, and a big old knife. Hell yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, you want to learn a little bit about. Well, is that the end of fish in the news? Yeah, let's go ahead. I think we're done, aren't we? News, news, fish in the news. <laughs> Everybody loves their fish in the I, news. I worked so hard to memorize where that button was this time that I had to hit All right. it at the end of the news. All right, John, bring us on Way to, to go, something. Man. Teach me something. 
Oh, I'm going to let Jeff Donaldson, the flatland fly fisher, teach you something with this next segment, which is on how to catch a gar on a gar fly. The Flatland Fly Fisher. All right, Jeff, we are here to talk about the gar quest. We have been on a quest to catch a gar, eat a gar. We've had three tries. We finally were successful on the third try. Uh, What I mainly want you to talk about today is the secrets of your success. Since I only got two fish halfway in, I'm I'm not nearly as in the knowledge slot as, as you are. On the other hand, you fooled around, experimented around, and you came up with a uh, fly rod and reel combo uh, of a fly fishing situation that I wanted to share with the listeners since we have so many fly fishers. Uh, let's just stick to that for this one. Let's go ahead and just hear kind of what you went through to get there, the rod and reel setup, the gar flies you tied, and a few things like that. Okay, so one of the things, obviously, that you see whenever you see people talking about fly fishing for guards, the rope fly. And which is literally just a piece of rope brushed out. Uh, and I was looking around on the internet to see kind of recipes about this stuff. And I kind of stumbled across a guy that does, well, I, I ran across a guy who I was familiar with from, from his podcast. His name is Rod, Rob Snow White. And he has a podcast called The Fly Fishing Consultant. And he was talking about using a synthetic material called uh, Widow's Web. Uh, which is just a, like a very fine po- polypropylene. And I had some similar material called EP fibers and EP stands for Enrico Puglisi. And that's uh, that's the guy that developed them for use in tying saltwater patterns. And it's just a, it's just a polypropylene material. It's a, it's, it's fine, but it's not too fine. It's got a tiny bit of like kink to it, but not a lot. And it's pretty durable. And so that kind of struck. And the other thing that's really great about it is, is it doesn't hold water. So when you get it wet and you pull it back up out of the water, it doesn't have a bunch of water soaked up in it. It's really uh, just, you know, when you do your back cast, it basically flings all the water off of it. And so it's not like casting a big wet sock, which can be the case with some big kind of big fluffy flies because these are big flies like the ones that i had success with they're a good like six seven inches long so you wouldn't want to cast that as something that holds a lot of water because it would just be like trying to cast a wet stock and so um i initially kind of had some flies that had some of that on it but i don't think there was enough of it so i it was a little too sparse because that was when we were out there at the at the river the very first time, I think. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and I that I couldn't keep them on, so I increased the amount of stuff because those were pike flies, and the the EP tail on it wasn't as thick as what I ended up using. So I ended up making these flies, and I I basically kind of like tripled the amount of the fiber that's on there. And it's not a complicated fly, really. It's just a hook with with some of this EP fiber tied on it, streaming out back behind it. Uh, you can see pictures of it on our Facebook group, but, and then I used a little, um, used a, a brush, a synthetic material brush to kind of form the, the, the head of the fly. And then there's just a thing called a fish mask that you can put over that lets you put like eyes on it. This is probably gilding the lily to be honest. Um, but it makes me happy. So I'm going to put the head with eyes and stuff on it. And, you know, there's some, some thought that like putting eyes on stuff makes things look more realistic to predators. But anyway, that turned out to be the fly. I think was that one right there. Cause it had a nice action. It kind of suspends. It doesn't sink. It doesn't really float. It kind of just kind of vaguely new it sinks, but slowly. And so, um, yeah. So then, First couple of tries, I would miss them because I was bass setting, <laughs> right? So I'm like, right, right. Yeah. yeah, so I'm like going, okay, I got a fish, better set the hook. And it's such a reflexive action that I had to like unlearn that, which was let them have it and let them chew on it for a while so they can get get it in their teeth. And the first one I got wasn't particularly big, um, but got it in. And what turned out to be pretty amazing about this EP stuff was it was very easy to get out of their teeth, which that was the thing that like I'd seen with a lot of the rope flies and stuff and people like, well, you're going to need a brush and a, or a this or that or something to get the stuff out of their teeth. But this stuff came right out. It wasn't like a big struggle trying to get it out of his teeth. 
once you got the jaw spreader in there and got the mouth open, it was it was pretty easy to get the stuff out. It didn't stick. And then it's pretty durable stuff. So once you got it out, I had a little a little comb in my pocket that I could just comb the material back out because it gets pretty snarled up when the fish gets a hold of it. But you can just comb that stuff right back out and it's pretty much good to go. I imagine that after maybe it, it probably does have a limited lifespan of getting chewed on by gar, but uh, you know, it held up pretty well. And then the, the other one that I caught, um, yeah, it was a bigger one again, pretty easy to get, get the stuff out of his teeth. Uh, so the one issue with these flies though, is that they're big and fluffy. And so <clears throat> I, I was using a 10 weight, fly okay, rod right. well i'm gonna have to cut in first you're you're, you're going yeah. on like like only yeah. you can go on about fly fishing which i love yeah. but i want to before we go into rods and stuff i want to talk about how important that relative almost neutral presentation where it's a super slow sinker so it's it's really hanging almost neutral in the water because when i the first time we went you were getting way more strikes than me and i switched to a just a plastisol three inch grub tail with no weight on it and I instantly started getting strikes, but they just kept snipping me off, snipping me off because I hadn't brought a leader. So that was my bad. But this is something that I think is absolutely essential. I've seen a lot of gar lures with spinner blades and jig heads and such on them. And they say they, they come in handy sometimes to gar go deep. And I'm certainly not going to sit here and pretend I know everything about gar fishing after doing it three times. But I did notice that's the lures that gave the predominant number of strikes. Uh, I, I wanted to get clear across the river, so I switched to mine. I made one out of cotton rope, which I actually, even though it seems more environmental friendly and all, I don't know if it's going to work as well. But I tied it uh, with sort of a Tokyo rig, so it would, you know, kind of hang there in the water. It, I had to put on like a half ounce weight to get it where I wanted to go, but it was kind of drop shotted, you know, like like a Tokyo rig, and right. so it was kind of hanging there. And that's the one I got my other strike, and I got my first strike on a weightless. This was the third time we went. I got my third strike on a weightless three-inch paddle tail grub, but I'd rigged this crazy flatfish style hook arrangement on it. So it had a lot of bar, a lot of trebles. I was hoping, you know, just from the preponderance of old school treble hook presence that, you know, I would get one, but it one came off. And the one I got my rope fly came off halfway. But you managed to get three in, one you professionally released right at shore, the really big one. And it just seemed like every fly that you were successful with had that real slow, neutral drop. And they were they were good looking flies. You had some crystal in there. Uh, a lot of people say pearl or white's the only color, but you you caught one on a green uh, John Deere green pattern, and the other the fly you caught the the two the two on had some nice accent. I think that crystal, especially yeah. in that river, was was a good addition. Yeah, that was kind of a goldish tannish color which i gotta imagine looks something like a maybe like a sucker or something like that too so yeah i originally bought that material to have it look like uh i can't remember what like some kind of white fish or something like that uh, for fishing in alaska for pike <laughs> but uh so i had that material already on hand so well it was fantastic so y'all listening that's kind of where you want to be really at least in our experience for the summertime gar nice slow sinking almost weight neutral pattern that that you know going to kind of give you you know kind of a you know if you want to equate it to a hard bait be like a jerk bait type action but anyway to throw one of these monsters though just going to tell you how to do it so fill us in because i know at one point you were a little frustrated but you got it all together and uh went smooth as silk in the second half of the day yeah well part of the problem was a i couldn't get as close to the water or in the water as i wanted <laughs> right i mean we <laughs> really wanted to be in the really wanted to be in the water fishing, right? right. But stand way back and cast out across that that mud, and it was all fine until a little bit of wind picked up, and then those big fluffy flies start to be a problem. And I do think that so the first rod I was using was a ten weight. It's got a bass taper. Well, it's a nine slash ten weight. It's a design basically for bass fishing. It's like a seven foot eleven. It's a TFO Temple Fork Outfitter Hog Leg, I think is what it's called. It's discontinued. They don't make it anymore, but it's basically meant for bass fishing. And it had a bass taper fly line on it. And even though it was a 10 weight fly line, I was still encountering some problems with casting into kind of a headwind because these flies are fairly big and fluffy. Now, uh, uh, let me interrupt again. I'm going to have to, because some of us are just kind of in, I'm a best method fisher. I like to fish with a fly rod, but I'm not into it like, like most fly fishing people are. A bass taper is what, like a weight forward taper? 
Yeah, it's a way it's a it's a way forward taper, and it's meant to cast things like poppers and things like that. Um, but I don't think it's quite meant to cast these great big huge. I think what I really need is like a pike or a musky taper to cast these really big, big, big fluffy flies because into the wind, it was fine until the wind picked up. That was when the problem kind of got to be a problem. And of course it was blowing from this across the river. Right. And so it wasn't like from upstream or downstream where I could kind of use it to my advantage. It was blown right into my face. And so uh, I do think the, the answer is going to be to go to either to use like a a pike or musky specific line or to simply just overline the rod. So, you know, go like two line sizes up. So go from like 10 to 12. I went and ran and got another rod out of the car, which is an eight weight that had a more aggressive taper on it that is kind of meant to, to cast some larger streamers, probably not as big as what I was casting, but that worked a little better. And I was able to get it out a little bit better into the wind with that one. It, it just is a m- more weight forward temp taper than the, than the bass taper. It's definitely meant for casting big streamers. And so it, it worked well. I think I'd probably, again, want more of something that's designed to cast pike and musky flies because they're big and air resistant. So, and even, and the other thing that I've been thinking about since we did it is changing my leader design to have a stiffer leader so that it um, doesn't kind of like parachute right there at the end of the cast. So you get your line going forward and it's going real nice and it gets right to the end of the cast. And then the momentum isn't carried through in through the leader out to the fly. And so it kind of acts like a little parachute and slows it down kind of right at the end of the cast. That said, I don't think I need to cast halfway to Mars to do this, but it was a little frustrating to be casting into the wind and having it losing about 10 feet on every cast, just because the wind would blow the fly back at me, you know? So I, I got some potential solutions for that, but then also just like, you know, I don't, I don't really think I need to cast that far because honestly they were biting pretty close to the bank. So I don't think that that was a big issue, but I do think it's going to get easier if I use a more aggressively tapered line that's more weight forward and meant to cast big streamers. Well, I'll tell you, I'm sure that you're right. Now, uh, what Jeff's al- alluding to is that when we got there, I just we got on this 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 bar that we like to fish, and it's it's kind of sandy on one end, but it's kind of really clay on the other end, and wasn't the first time we visited this river it really wasn't giving us any problems but this time i just marched right on out there and the next thing you know i was up past my ankles i wasn't even paying attention i was just fishing and um you said something to me and i went to turn around and both my uh, feet were clear down in that wet sticky kansas clay and i fell flat on my back and you had to get my waiting staff and drag me out and then i had to crawl back in ice fishing style on my belly to get my boots back and it was quite yeah. the time so that's when jeff's talking about hey i didn't want to get too close to the edge that's what now that he's afraid of gators or snappers no 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 he's afraid of that oozy goopy kansas mud that he is also familiar with but we'll save that story for another time yeah yeah we're not going to learn everything today right now uh we just want to fill the listeners in because i've had a few contact me hey how's the gar fishing going what's going on i sure appreciate you taking time before you got to run off to work here this morning to uh talk to us is there anything else you want to say about the setup or what you got planned for the future i just i tied a few more last night just to just because you know i'm like a, a, another couple small variations i'm like okay these are kind of took some inspiration from some tarpon flies that were out that were around uh and just but i'm trying to make them maybe i'm also trying to see what the minimum amount of this stuff that will tangle their teeth without being too air resistant so like the pike fly that i had was definitely didn't have enough to get it tangled up but you know maybe i don't need three times as much so and i'm also made them a little shorter i'm shortening them too to see like how long do they need to be because i think if we get back in there especially uh, it looks like maybe the e- evening <laughs> because things were really starting to pick up right before we left that's uh, right this- I mean, there was really kind of in the middle of the day, the activity kind of died down. And then right as about time we were getting ready to leave again, they started to pick back up and you could see a lot of activity. You know, I'm thinking if we go out there in the evening, this could be a good test lab where I can try out a bunch of different flies to see see what works. Because if I can shorten the flies, that'll certainly help with the casting issues as well. So fly design and then also um, maybe it, investigating some other lines the good thing about these things is you kind of got to worry about them because it's hot you know a lot of fish when it's hot out and the water's warm and the oxygen's low maybe you don't want to stress them 
by fishing for them, but these things, you're not going to hurt them. They, they can breathe air. They're, they're tough. They're not going to, they're, they're, everything I've read seems to say that like, they actually like this hot weather and this hot, hot water. It's like kind of their jam. They're the one thing that the fishing will pick up even when it's a hundred degrees out. So don't think we're going to hurt them by fishing for them. So, um, and they're still active and still feeding. Uh, we saw it. So I'm, I'm all, I'm all about it. It's just another, another one of my little rabbit holes to bury down and I'm in it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And we will be going back and there's a lot more we could say about, Oh gosh, the schools of shad we saw and the idea that they travel in pods of, of pretty size matched fish and so on. But we got to stop, Jeff. We got to stop. Okay. Stop. Because we're going to do a two-parter here. So now Jeff has told us all about the fly fishing and stay tuned because we're going to come back with Jeff here in a little bit. And he's going to talk about cooking one up. All right, Clay. So you think you're going to pick up your uh, fly rod and give a uh, gar a chance one of these times? John, I, I, gar are so exciting to me. Like the idea of catching a gar to me is so exciting. I, I would, I would catch a gar any way I was allowed to. So fly fish, spin casting, um, maybe a serrated knife. I'm in. Well, I'll tell you, it is exciting. And although I'm a dedicated spin fisher, um, Jeff has got this fly fishing method to where he's getting way more action than me. And, you know, he's talking about loaning me one of his poles and getting me into a little fly casting for him because um, not only does it look like a lot of fun, but I, you know, I'm still messing around. Maybe I'm a step or two behind him. I'm going to bring the spin fishing up to the fly fishing level, but I may have to cop out every now and then and catch one on the fly rod myself because uh, we, we spent three days, tried our favorite river twice. We tried a different river once. Finally, on the third try is when we, we started to catch, and I lost both of mine halfway in, just like I said in the story. Uh, but he, uh, we learned a lot and, and he, you know, it was his day and he put it on me pretty bad. So I may have to pick up that old fly rod. All right. What I got coming up next, Clay is the <laughs> special report on fishing. And this was, again, this is kind of like Tim Beach show. Cause he sent me this a long time ago. And uh, I mean, relatively a couple, well, maybe not a couple, but about three, four weeks ago. And it, it, it's a report on fishing, the demographics and so forth. Uh, it's compiled by the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation and the Outdoor Foundation. Anyway, we'll have links if you want to get into it, because I'm not even going to be able to even begin to cover this. Uh, I'm just going to read you some facts out of it, get your reaction, um, you know, ask you a couple questions, but really super interesting. I mean, definite fish nerd material. One thing I can tell you is there were a couple of, of dark spots in it, but for the most part, the future of fishing in the United States of America is quite bright. Excellent. And yeah, it is excellent. And um, so what's going on is we had a big surge in fishing in the pandemic. Um, but what's happened is that um, we really haven't turned out that many anglers. We're still increasing. Uh, went down a little bit in 21, but actually now we're, we're back up. In 22, this is a report on 2022. Uh, these folks have been putting this report out for the past 15 years. Um, so the, the highest uh, number of anglers was 54.7 million in 2020, um, 54.5 million now in 2022. The lowest was in 2010 with 45.4 million. So we have come up quite a ways. Yeah, there was a big, and big boom there for a while. It was a big boom. So, you know, in 2022, you know, we churned out a couple million anglers. We picked up 4.4 million new participants, but we lost, but you know, some. So the net gain was about 2.1. Um, they talk about how fishing is less diverse than the overall population. And I look at that in a lot of different ways. I don't know what your take on it is. I know that. Well, how are um, they measuring it? Like, are they well, like taking that stat when you get your license? So like, all that data is in there somewhere. No, and I didn't get to come through because their scientific way they generated all this stuff was at the very end, and I'm not, I'm not real good with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know there's folks, Doc Martin, that could read this and just be right on how they did it and yeah, all that. I'm but, so curious because like, you have to adjust for, so you they only can they can only survey licensed anglers who will participate in the in the survey, so that sounds like a limiting factor all by itself. 
Well, they did not do only licensed anglers. So I don't know exactly, but oh. they tried to come up with what's, you know, called a representative sample. So sure. they had, since black people are 13% of the population, they made thir- sure 13%, 6% of our population's Asian. So that 6% Asian well, people. That's good, so, I guess. That's hard but to- they actually had, you know, a percentage of people that never buy a fishing license. So they admit, admitted they were poachers and oh. jerks. And, <laughs> uh, you know, this kind of a thing. Now, where I get is where they're comparing statistics and they they talk about participation versus actual a uh, person that you know talk calling himself a fisher and so forth how they break down uh this stuff was a, a bit uh interesting to me a bit confusing to me as well but um let's just say you know they they've got a representation a representative sample of well the overall population <laughs> of the united states yeah okay so then they interview these people and they find out that 18 percent of people six and up like to fish Okay, so out of this 10,000 people, 1,000 people, I can't remember what it was, you know, <laughs> you, you got them, 18% say, yeah, I fish. And then they ask them more questions, I guess. Okay. Um, now, one of the cool things about it is that the women have keep coming up every year, every year, every year. They're 36% of the total now. Good. And uh, the diversity is coming up because the number of younger people keeps going up. But I just, you know, when it comes to access and why uh, black people and Latinos and people that are not, you know, it's still, you know, 61 or 60, whatever percent of the population is white, 70 some percent of the people that fish are white. So it's not as representative, you know, it's not as diverse as the population overall. And I just wonder what your take on that might be. It's a hard one to measure. I don't know. I I don't env- envy anybody that's doing these kind of studies because when you try to account for everybody, I think you're always going to have mistakes and errors. Oh, absolutely. So There's always a, what do they call it, a standard deviation. Deviation, and yeah. But I also think there's errors that you can't mathematically account for. And that's people who don't want to do surveys, who don't want to get involved, who lie on surveys. I don't right. know. I, I, it's just, it's just, I think it's hard. Surveys are hard. I think, I think a tough way to be accurate with measurement. I, I don't. Well, they're certainly not precise. Let's put it that way. No, they're, they're helpful. They are. They are. They are indicators. Yeah, and also, market. like, and if, and if, let's just say, for example, you're in a population that doesn't that feels marginalized, right? But then you also don't participate in these surveys, but you feel marginalized. I think in some ways you're marginalizing yourself. Yes. Or is that my privilege saying that? Or both? You know, I don't know. I would if I was. Well, I'm. You know. I can, I all don't you know can if I can say I'm marginalized. I've, I've been lower income all my life. Right. I'm, me too. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a rural person uh, yeah. most of my life. Um, you know, so I fit in somewhere, but I, you know, but I, I am well-educated. So I, I believe in participating and I believe yep. in, Hey, I know surveys aren't perfect, but I don't believe that they're going to take my information and give it to the aliens or right. anyone else. So I'll go ahead and do it. You don't have that um, like distrust of it by itself. So it, that's the hard yeah, thing. Yeah, well, the, and people are justified to an extent, uh, at least in their sure. own minds. But well, they, some they people can, have been really burned, so it's hard. You bet. Know? You bet. But mostly it just gives us a bunch to chew on, a bunch to think about, yeah. a bunch to look at. And um, instead of a horrible, complex question like I just asked mm-hmm. about, uh, you know, perception of fishing among minorities and so forth, let's just talk about which type of fishing this was one of the strange things about this report is that it broke fishing down into freshwater Ooh. saltwater uh-huh. and fly fishing mm. so you have two environmental categories yes. and one method category which yes. i found rather strange oh so so are you going to ask me about diversity of fishes or diversity of people each category diversity of people uh-huh. in which has the greatest freshwater saltwater or fly fishing i think fly fishing has the least amount of diversity i see that as that a very true. very rich white sport and uh, i've been get I've, people have gotten mad at me for saying that before but i still see it that way well this but, study seems to indicate that yep. it is um it is the, the least diverse is this for just sure. united states or global study just united states all right so given how big a country is we have more freshwater than saltwater but I still think saltwater is more diverse. You win. Yep. Saltwater is the most diverse. Uh, and uh, I think freshwater is pretty well, I bet it's balanced out pretty good. But I think saltwater has more food opportunity. 
And that's why you know, the that maybe is higher. That, that, yeah. And you know, the thing about it, it's just wild to me, but like I watch um Rosie on Instagram. Rosie and O'Donnell? Do of, no, our oh. friend Rosie from Rosie's Tackle oh, Shop, right. that sweet little girl. <laughs> and they're, you know, they do a lot of jetty fishing and shoreline fishing, and I'll be darned, you know, the whole idea uh surf fishing whatever of fishing off the shore of the ocean you know i get all stressed when i fish in a pond where i can't get to the other side and i wish i had my boat right i can't imagine you know it's such a big place have you it's a big place but 80 you're, you're, you're in kansas i am in kansas so i having i having lived on the ocean living now in the mountains the ocean still offers the most excitement for fishing to me cool yeah and the most fish like there's so many fish well, and I think the sustenance end of it is because it also bait fishing is the absolute number one method uh, when you go into the ocean. You know, artificial lures and so forth come come way, way behind. That's right. Okay, so let's talk about total participation. All right. Now, this is going to shock you, but <laughs> where do you think most fishers live in terms of total numbers? So give me an example of what I mean. What we mean by where. northeast, southeast, midwest, uh, far west. I think southeast. Southeast is correct. Yep. Because you have that because whole you... like Panhandle, Gulf of Mexico. Exactly. There's so many people down there. There's so much fishing down there. But now let's flip it to participants per capita. What does per capita it, mean? That means per person. So, okay. um, you know, is it the Mountain West? Is it the Northeast? Is it the Southeast? Is it the Midwest? Or is it the the California, the Coastal West? Ooh. Uh, northeast. Northeast comes in second. Actually, the Mountain West, which includes Colorado and Alaska. So inland. Oh, wait, wait. Colorado so, and Alaska are connected in the. Fishing? No, but I mean they're part of the part of the the mountains of you know mm. the mountains run all the way up there. Anyway, in this survey, they okay. left Alaska in. Um, but these states have such low populations. You see, Wyoming is very high. Almost everybody there goes trout fishing. That's true. And, and they're fishing because they're eating the fish too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it's not with fly fishing. They're they're using poles and and mm-hmm. spin rods as much as they are fly fishing. Northeast though came in second. Okay. And uh, which has more f- fishers, Vermont or New Hampshire? Uh, it's got to be New Hampshire. It is Vermont. What? Oh, screw those guys. Those jerks. All (laughs) all they are is New Hampshire upside down. Uh, They think because their cows are black and white, they're special. Oh, Vermont. How dare you? How dare they? And of course, Maine is is very strong as well. So I'm sure uh, Maine is awesome for fishing. Now, here's a here's a fun little thing for you. You know, let's all go fishing. Okay. Avid and occasional fishers are people who would fish uh at least once a month Mm -hmm. occasional fishers less than once a month Um, but out of these two groups that show an enthusiasm towards fishers 49 percent wish they could fish more if they could but 48 percent, remarkably enough say they are fishing the amount they want to do okay so it's not about enthusiasm for a lot of people or it's not a complete geek out and we're going to get that to that here down the line but um, avid anglers comprise 33% in number of trips or times, which is the term they use, times going fishing. And a uh, casual fisher, on the other hand, is 31%. That only goes one to three times a year. So these statistics uh, balance so well in fishing. To and, and they're all happy between, with the amount of fishing they're doing. Uh, well, half of them aren't and half oh. of them are. I yeah. mean, but that's the thing is, it, I want to make us, you know, this is the thing. You're you're fine if you're not as crazy about fishing as Clay and me and Jeff and everybody else that gets on this show and talks on this show, Angie Scott and all the rest of us. You like to just go out a couple times a year. You just do that and you feel good about yourself because you got plenty of company, you know? John, I met people, and, and I bring them on my boat, who go on boat rides. But you're not going to believe this, John. They don't fish. It's shocking. It's just, it's, it's, it's shocking. It's shocking. But they'll come on the boat ride and they'll pay me a whole bunch of money to not go fishing. That is, I, I can't yeah. understand it. I don't understand it. I'm like, what are you doing? 
And like, we want to go sightseeing, we want to drink beer, smoke a cigar. And like, but you could do all those things and you can catch an animal. <laughs> well, it's, it's always like someone looking at, you know, why the heck are you riding that jet ski? You ought to be fishing. And then they're looking at you going, fishing? No way. You know, that's boring. Or the real boring. heroes on the jet ski fishing tournaments. <laughs> that's, that's a real thing john and it's amazing oh my gosh that's that is too much it looks like so much fun so well now i want to ask you a question because sure. they just use this term how many times do you go mm-hmm. but we all know there's short trips long trips this that and the other thing right sure. so like a full day fishing you know i i technically if if you're just counting times i go 100 to 150 times a year because i've got a pond mm-hmm. of my own i got ponds you know, within a minute of my house, mm-hmm. um, all that. Uh, but as far as like day long fishing trips, like Jeff and I just took in our gar quest, mm-hmm. probably 20, 30 times a year. Now do, 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 do my short trips count in this study? They do. But what do you say, Clay? So I'll tell you this on my own, John, I don't do all day fishing trips. Like if I go fishing, like on my, by myself, two hours to me, I'm happy as hell. Want to go fishing with Dave Kellum down the ocean, down in Portsmouth? Maybe three hours. We're both happy as hell. So for me, I've never done a whole day fishing unless I paid someone to take me way out in the ocean on a boat. I, for me, two or three hours of fishing, I've caught fish. Now I'm on to the next project. So I don't know how to measure that stuff. I guess well, it's, it's in all individual. You're, you're good to go. I am. It is individualized. I just wondered if you were like, oh no, if it, you know, like, it I, like the other day, the other day, the other day I was craving wild brook trout. I just wanted to go catch some wild brook trout. So at 6 a.m., I hit the river and I was done by 7 30. I probably caught 15 wild brook trout. I was happy as hell. Then I collected some wild mushrooms, another hour of that, and I went home and I was happy. Well, that's so, just it. And that's the only reason to fish, you know, do what makes you happy. Sure. Um, you know, certainly, uh, there are those of us who will, you know, like my nephew TJ, when he was six years old, he'd fall asleep, you know, with a fishing rod in his hand. He mm-hmm. would not stop. He I, would I not used to stop. be like that. I used to be like that. But, um, you know, now he's got a girlfriend, so he's, he's kind of eased well, up. You know what, John, you might not know this, you know, because Kathy's perfect, but for most yes. of us, girls ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that argument can be made, but I'm going to steer away from that, okay? <laughs> Drive and we're going to steer right on into youth fishing, okay? Okay. And youth fishers uh, comprise about uh, 7.8 million, uh, 6 to 12, and about 5 million adolescent fishers. John, uh, I took 5 million kids fishing today. That's what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll bet. We took, there was... Between the hour and a half, Zoe and I were fishing with kids at the camp we fished at. In the hour and a half time, uh, about 25 kids cycled through our fishing class. And wow. We, we, have 12, we had 12 rods, and we were just nonstop catching fish, untangling lines, catching fish, untangling lines. Yep. So I think I felt like every kid on the planet was fishing with me today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well... We we love the kids because they're the most diverse, most environmentally aware, and the most open-minded anglers out there. But the thing is, it is absolutely crucial. We talk a lot about fishing education on this show, and we should because you got to get the kids started young. It's like a lot of things about good habits or habits in general, good or bad. Um, anglers that start before age 12 have way more chance of sticking with it for life than those that start after that that's right you get the kids addicted early (laughs) exactly now when did you start fishing clay i don't remember i i remember always having fished so my my parents in the coast guard when i was growing up and so we grew up on the ocean and fishing was just a thing one did so there was no like first time i I can't call my first fish fishing is just something i've always done well, then you probably started like as a toddler, probably out there at age two or something. Like oh, that, probably. Right? And my kids, I'm, and my kids started fishing. Uh, like Zoe, when she was a baby, I would bring her out. Uh, I would cross country ski out in the lake with her in a ski pulk, which is a, a ski tent for kids that you can drag behind you when you're skiing. And I had her fishing when she was months old. So that's just yeah. crazy cool. I love that. Yeah. Now, me on the other hand. I remember my first fish. I was three years old. 
I, you know, I never did spin cast or nothing. I got handed a five foot ultralight rod and, um, we went up to a lake that was cycled up for big crappie. Mm-hmm. And, and although we only caught a dozen crappie that day, uh, my first fish was a crappie over two pounds. There so it is. You wonder why you were, you were, I'm you partial. Were, you grew your hair long. You became a hippie. You were yeah. three. Yeah, it is. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I can still remember the old guys that were there telling me, you know, when, when that reel makes that noise now, don't just keep turning the handle. You just hang on. Right. You know, I mean, then, you know, when you can, you, you, you reel, but when, you know, so they, I, I can remember the whole, and then when I got it in, they were all like, holy smokes, you know, just a bunch of cheering and a mm-hmm. bunch of carrying on about it. Yep. So it was quite the event, but yeah, it, it not only made me an angler, it made me a crappie angler for life. Look at you now. Look at me now, derelict and <laughs> doing shows for free. For free. All right. Welcome to my world. <laughs> you That's signed up did. for this hell, John. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> This okay, is my now. nightmare. I, I love it, but I can't stop doing it, and there's no money. <laughs> <laughs> why, oh, why? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I'm going to wind this up. Now, there's plenty more. You could, Like I say, you can just sit and look at this for hours. It, it's really it, It's uh, fascinating. Cool. Tell us where people can find the report. Well, we're going to put it. It's called a special report on fishing, and mm-hmm. you, we'll, we'll have the links in the show notes. I, I, will, I will remember to do that tomorrow. You please do. And... Uh, so you just you can go and you can get it, but you can type in your Google. It's been published in a couple of different places, and you can link through it through uh, some pages just by typing in a special report on fishing. Uh, it's the Recreational Boat and Fishing Foundation and the Outdoor Foundation have put it out. So perfect. Um, all right. So you ready to feel special, my man? Let's do it. Make me feel special. I want to make you feel special. Now, you dabble with a fly rod, right? I do. And you fish fresh and salt water. I do. And your percentage is 2%. There's only 2% of fishers that, that do all that. Wow. That's amazing. And that's not shocking given how, is that, no, this is domestic, but given how big our country is and how few oceans we have comparatively. Yeah, it's crazy. There's very little overlap in fishing. 61% fish freshwater. Mm-hmm. Uh, only 10% fish fresh and salt. Yep. Um, but my question there is like, do I count as a salt angler? Every time I've had the opportunity to fish in salt water, I've taken it, of course. But I've still only do done it. it. I've still only done it half, you know, handful of times. It's because where you live. It's because where I live. You know, it's kind of like the trout fishing. When, um, you know, I I, I want to catch a trout, I have to go somewhere. But when I do go somewhere, and someone says, "Hey, you want to go trout fishing?" I, I don't. You know, I jump right on it. I don't even hesitate. So, you know, the thing about salt fishing for me, even when I've visited the Northeast and so forth uh is it's a lot easier for me to go trout fishing than it is for me to go bluefish right. or something because you know i can get more stoked about pike or smallmouth or yellow perch with you because i got the gear you know right. and a lot of my gear will translate uh, trout fishing you'd be but- shocked john bring your freshwater grid gear to the ocean and do exactly what you do in freshwater you'll be amazed at all the fish you catch well i, I can't wait to it's do it it's shocking it's shocking and well i and 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 and, and it, it translates really well. Like, if you want to catch pollock all day long, hit a jetty off the coast of Rye, New Hampshire, fishing freshwater, little tiny cast masters, or your little crappie doolers, or whatever you want to fish, you catch them off the off the all day long. And everyone around you won't be catching any fish because they're fishing giant hooks with giant hunks of bait for for bluefish or for or for uh, striped bass. But you'll be catching these like twelve inch pollocks all day, and you'll be happy well. as hell. And, I will, it will, yep. because I will. And those are good to eat, right? They're de- wonderful to eat, yeah. They're That's delicious. What I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm all over it. Yep. Okay, now, frequency. Okay. Anglers that fish over 104 times a year, 2%. That's me. 50 to 103 times a year, 4%. So you and I are in some, we're in the crazy category. Well, we're I mean, in the eight up with it category. John, I have an excuse. <laughs> I, I get paid to do it. <laughs> you're just regular crazy <laughs> i am just regular crazy that's for sure now i'm gonna finish up in conclusion the study is absolutely loaded with good demographic info and it's amazing geek out my one disappointment clay there wasn't nothing on ice fishing i'm sorry about that my brother they, i find they, that they, shocking it is i shocking. bet it would say only people ice fishing Speaking only, of crazy the only ice fish where it's cold yeah <laughs> yeah 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 uh, but it never got into methods by popularity. And I tried to find a study on that. And by golly, I sat there for about 40 minutes trying and I couldn't find one. Well, that's the next, grand, this, that's the next one. 
this yeah i guess grant search here we go uh but in spite of the you know the flaws and or and not necessarily flaws or the oversights however you want to see it great read interesting too but i'm going to finish off a couple of fun stats here's one that i love 40 when people's perception of fishing 42 percent of people who want to try fishing do it or think they want to do it because it appears to be low stress yes but 41 percent of people want to try fishing because it looks so exciting <laughs> So I, once again, that's there's a, so much karma in fishing. It's such a balance. See, I find the exciting part to be the stress reliever. Exactly. You know, you get that big fish, and all of a sudden, you forget about everything else. You do, and so you're excited, but that's a stress relief. But you know, the people that think it's exciting, like they've maybe watched a show or something where it's just you know catch porn, where everybody's just catching, catching, catching. They the number one reason people quit fishing is they find it boring. Well. That's because they haven't had success, enough success. Exactly. exactly. You know, you that's need to have enough success early on where you keep at it. And that's why new fishers should be fishing for small fish in high numbers and not going for like the trophy fish right away. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Knowing what you're doing, knowing how to just catch. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obstacles to enjoyment to fishing. Um Number one, fishing spots are too crowded. So then we're talking about access here, which is sure. another reason people in urban environments and so forth have a different perception of fishing than, say, people that live where I do or you do. Mm-hmm. Um, the hazards of being outdoors, bugs, heat, cold, lightning, all that stuff. Yep. People don't want to be in that. Bunch of wusses. <laughs> Not catching fish is number three. But the one that bums me out the most is... They go to the lake. Number four is I went to the lake. I went to the river, trashed out with litter, wasn't clean, found out the fish I caught wasn't safe to eat. So yep. the lakes and rivers aren't very clean in this country. And that, that is, is fair. sad. And, and a fair response. Like that's enough for me to like go oh, screw it. I'm not going anymore. Yeah. If I, I was fishing I, in garbage but, every day, I probably would not want to do it. No, I wouldn't want to do it either. And there's places right around me where it just, just rips me in yeah. two. Because uh, I, I don't want to stomp around being hacked off and i don't want to stomp around being sad and i don't want to spend my day picking up after a bunch of idiots right so there's just just places that i won't go yeah anyway i won't go through the rest of them but the the number four and number one were really really on my mind because uh those are things we can change absolutely and those are things we can do something about um but to end it on a positive note yeah please john please i I can't take it anymore john i can't take it you can't take it anymore but Here's the good news. When a person's thinking about fishing or actually plans a fishing trip, 27% either hire or consult a guide. That's a high number. That is a high number. That's, and, and the consulting is an important detail, John, because yes. as a guide, I get calls every week of people who can't afford to hire me but still want information. And do you know what I do? Give it to them. No, I lie. No. <laughs> yes, yes, John, I, I give it to them. I'll even give them the GPS coordinates of where the fish are because I want everyone to catch fish and have a great time. And I don't think you're competing with anybody for fish. I think there's plenty of fish around. Is You're ethical, you're kind, you help each other, and you just go out and have fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry people compete and cool people uh, yep. cooperate, yep. cool people collaborate and so on. So yep. that's where I'm at with it too. Oh, and speaking of. Oh, God. Let's end this show on a positive note how about a little trip to culinary corner for our final piece oh, tonight? culinary corner all right what are you gonna do with that fish that if you kill it will you grill it will you blacken it in the skillet we gotta make it delicious so it's not All righty, now we're back with the culinary side of our Gar Quest. And Jeff kept one about 20, 22 inches long. First one he caught. Um, and we put it on the stringer. And that rascal went home and cooked it up right away and sent me a message about how darn good it was. And that's all I can say about it. So I'm going to let this young man take over and tell us how he cleaned it. And how he cooked it, and fill you in on how delicious it was. Jeff, go ahead. All right. So, 
Number one, this was not as hard to get into as I was led to believe. So when you watch any videos about cleaning gar, it's like, you know, you're going to need like a, a lightsaber and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, granted, this was not a particularly big fish. And so I don't think its skin was as thick as maybe some of the big ones. But I managed to get in pretty easily just with one of those electric Rapala knives. Um, started with the, I did the tail method where you get the upper, the very upper top part of the tail. Um, because it's a, it has a heterocircle tail, science term for you all out there, meaning that like the tail's um, not symmetrical and the spine kind of continues out into the very top part of the fin, uh, of the tail fin, the caudal fin. And so if you come right in under that top part of the the caudal fin, the tail, get right in under that and then start going up the back, you can peel a strip of the skin off the top of the back. And that worked pretty well with the <clears throat> with the with the electric fillet knife. I mean, it took a little I mean, I had to put some force on it, but it wasn't like crazy. It wasn't like as I was led to believe, like you're going to need like, you know, adamantium to get into this thing. <laughs> And then once you get in, it's really pretty easy because because the skin is so hard, you can take a small knife and just work it in between the skin and the meat, and it just peels away really easily. And then, you know, you basically I just cut the head off and the tail off, and then I'm and then just basically kind of peel the skin off of it, and you end up with this long muscular tube. And then right along the back are two essentially tenderloins that you can that you can flay off from there. And there's some other meat on it, some belly meat and some rib meat, but this one wasn't big enough to, to really want to warrant messing with that. So I took those two uh, tenderloins off. Looked like, I mean, looks like any other fish meat, pretty much. Maybe a little more, um, oh, a little more meaty, more on that later. But, and then I just chopped it up into little nuggets, basically. And I did what I do with any, like, kind of, relatively large fish is is that i'll put throw it in a bowl of water and leave it in the refrigerator overnight and then just took it out the next day and i put some 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 like sweet potato starch you can use corn starch i just had some sweet potato starch from another recipe that i'd done that i was going to use you could use corn starch and panko on it shook it up in a thing uh seasoned it with some seasoning stuff that i got from penzies called uh Ruth Ann's, if you like to cook fish, get some of that Ruth Ann's Muskegon something or other for chicken and fish. It's really good stuff. Anyway, fried it in a pan, you know, kind of not quite deep fried it, but fried it in some oil in a pan. And, you know, I took, it's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and eat this stuff. And I'm not having great expectations. I'm like, yeah, this is probably one of those things where it's okay. You know, people be like, yeah, if you like fish, you'll like this. You know, those of us that really like fish will eat things that other people won't. Well, I had that first bite of it. I'm like, Oh my God, this stuff is delicious. It is absolutely <laughs> delicious. It has a lovely, nice texture. It is chewier than something like catfish. It's not quite to something like shark, but it's definitely chewier. Maybe something like a uh, spoonbill, if you've ever had it, paddlefish. Well, how, about, how about halibut? Is it, is it in that zone? Yeah, yeah, it's probably in there. And okay. yeah, nice, chewy, nice, mild flavor. It's not it's not like tilapia where it doesn't have any flavor at all, but it has a nice, mild, white fish flavor. And just the, the texture is really nice. It's got a little bit more chewiness to it than something like catfish. It's really good. I was just blown away by how good it was. I was not expecting much, you know, because you, people don't talk that much about eating these things as a food fish. It's not, you know, it's kind of thought of as a trash fish. And let me tell you, it's not a trash fish. <laughs> it, it's it's good. It may be a little bit of, of a pain to get into. And yeah, maybe if you catch a big one, it might be harder to get into that, get through that outer shell and into the meat. But let me tell you, that meat is absolutely just a, a prime table fish. I, I'm going to do this again for sure. Uh, I am going to stick with keeping the smaller ones because they're a large predatory fish that's fairly long lived. And so that is going to lead to problems with bioaccumulation of things like mercury and pesticides and stuff like that. But I think the smaller ones that we're looking at, like that one, like 20, 24 inches, something like that, you know, younger fish, that's 
and they're not super hard to clean, not nowhere near as hard to clean as I thought it was going to be. They're getting, they're on my menu now <laughs> for sure. I, that is a really good fish to eat. Hey, man, you're making me want to rush right on back there. I'm telling you, I'm no, going I, nuts. We're in the middle of a heat wave. It's supposed to be 105 today. I'd still go ahead and go on back there. Well, I'm definitely, if I was, I'm definitely getting into that water. I don't care if I have to crawl in my mud, crawl on my belly through the mud to get into the water. But <laughs> I have to put a weed eater and whack a path down through the, through the head high nettles to get to our favorite sandbar down there. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's a prime eating fish. It really is. It's not one of those things where you're like, well, you know, it's good, but it's all full of bones or whatever no it does not have bones it's and it is really good in terms of flavor and texture just uh you know this is this is something that more people should try because it, well, it is really good and if you're out there shooting with a bow and arrow don't just throw them in the river to let them die yeah keep them clean, clean them. them clean them and eat them i let me tell you something just you know my experience with this is when i started eating drum i would keep a oh, drum around a pound or so and then i gotta keep one about two pounds but when they get around three pounds Man, that skin really does start getting a lot tougher. The flavor does get stronger. And while there's a lot of folks that, that think, you know, that's great and it, and it's perfectly good to me, but for the people in my life that want a fish closer to crappie or catfish, it definitely pays as far as cleaning them and eating them. Eat those small ones. And the thing about it, though, is that I'm thinking maybe like when I made paddlefish, the one time I got to fix it, I used, a, I made some plain and I made some Asian style which I can only say Asian style because I'm not an authentic Asian cook, like Asian cuisine type person like you, but, uh, you know, some soy sauce, uh, not so much garlic, but some soy sauce, uh, some ginger, some brown sugar, you know, that kind of a thing. What, what do you think? That'd be good on gar. Oh yeah. I, I think this thing lends itself to all sorts of preparations because it's a nice, it, it's an, I, I'm thinking maybe to try to smoke it too, um, because it's a Ooh. little more meat. Yeah. Um, so that may be on, cause I got that new smoker that, uh, co-worker well it's not new but it's new to me co-worker gave me a really nice electric one of those pellet smokers which is like a game changer for a lot of stuff but so yeah i'm not trying to smoke it too so that's that's uh that's i got all kinds of ideas i get, John, I get these rabbit holes and look what happens to me look what happens great. to yeah hey you know I'm, I'm, i enjoy being a bad influence on this because we're just a couple of nerds and we want to find this stuff out but okay if i was gonna smoke it or grill it you know i know it's the one guy you know that grilled it he kept it in the skin you know i'm always worried about evaporation of moisture loss in any of those environments so I probably want to put a pan of water or something in there to kind of keep yeah. it uh uh, moist or you know i don't want to wrap it in bacon because i don't want it to taste like smoky hog i want it to taste like smoky fish yeah i'd probably run the smokers low temperatures i could run it too um and, and do it that way but um and i'd probably maybe brine it before i did it yeah. too so probably i'd probably kind of try to treat it like one of the leaner salmons basically like maybe like chum salmon or pink salmon something like that that's it doesn't have quite as much fat content that would probably smoke up pretty good. We'll just see. It's an experiment. We'll figure it out. Well, we will come back with those experiments when they happen. Uh, don't expect this scar thing to go away. We might take hiatus because there's a whole world of fish, fishing and eating fish that we need to talk about. But we have got this under our skin. It's given us the itch. And Jeff and I will find ourselves back with new lure designs, new fly designs, a new attitude. And we will be checking out some new fishing spots as well. So thank you for coming in this morning, Jeff. I appreciate you coming in and filling us in. All right. Yeah. We'll see you back out on the river, John. What are you going to do? Well, I tell you, Jeff's got me so turned on. You know, we just kept the one little gar. He cleaned it. He ate it. He's been telling me how great it is. I got to just get back and get me one. Sorry, Doc. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't kill the one we caught. I had, to, I had to have Jeff do it when I was off taking care of nature. It's always uh, good to have a murder for hire person with you. Murder for hire person, yeah. yeah but uh, after, you know, he described it and the different ways he's hoping to cook it and did cook it and all this stuff. And what I've read, I, I'm just about going to have to try it. So... There you go. That was a nice culinary corner and or culinary corner. And thank Shoot you it. once again 
Jeff Danielson. Who else we need to thank tonight, Clay? Well, of course, we need to thank, uh, let's thank Wally Pleasant for our theme music. Let's thank uh, Diane's Bath Salts for our news theme. And not working. Baycaster Cylinder. Baycaster Cylinder. Baycaster Cylinder. Yeah, ba- for that for the uh, culinary music. And John, of course, thank you to you for being part of this and making this happen. And thank you to Tim B for sending in stories. And Tim, who to he's dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't have Lure Love, I'm not going to say his name out and out loud. Tim, who? Okay. <laughs> All right. Y'all been listening to a couple of... I used to like that guy, John. I used to like him. I went fishing with him and everything. I know it. He took away my favorite podcast. I know it. He took it away. (laughs) Broke my heart, Tim. Oh, hopefully one day. Betrayals are hard. All right. Bring the show to the end. Whatever. Let's let's end the show. All right. Tim Beat, how dare you? (laughs) (laughs) All righty. So... Remember to follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early and often. Never trust a free lunch with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. You did it, John. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, <laughs> get it, man. Wet, or deep in the ocean, casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the halibut. Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.